Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got another gr uh, great guest, somebody who I've been on his show a few times, but I've always wanted to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with him, so I'm very glad that he's joining me today. It is Gio, and I'm going to let Gio say his last name so I don't <laughs> butcher it, uh, but Gio is the, uh, is the uh, co-host of the Break the Rules uh, podcast. They've got huge guests on there all the time, so definitely check that out, and he's also a very gifted artist and someone who really understands that discipline. So Gio, thanks for joining me, man. Oh, thank you. The pleasure is mine, Oren. I mean, this is uh, exciting. Finally, we're having a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yeah, yeah, it's always fun to do break the rules, but there, you know, there's mm -hmm. there's often you know four, six, eight people, and so yeah. uh, you know it can be difficult to really pursue a thread that you want to. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's nice to have that option to. Yeah, it's it's hard to manage sometimes. Yeah, and, you're well, definitely. <laughs> you guys yeah. are definitely hurting cats over there at, at times for sure. Oh God! Well, like we like uh, we were talking about before the logo versus Amy stream that well. Hurting two particularly voracious cats. That's kind of, <laughs> you know. But my last name is, well, technically pronounced Penichetti, but Penichetti is the Anglo, yeah. Anglo yeah, well, they're name. naming you after some form of bacon, right? Like that's <laughs> <laughs> Penchetta. Right, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, what was the first you wanted? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the first thing I always ask uh, people, and uh, for Gio, I'm particularly interested because you're kind of in two worlds. So Gio, first, could you tell me how you got involved in art? Is that something you did from when, when you were young, or is it something you trained in, and that's really when it got started for you? How did you get plugged into art? Um, My mother like dabbled in painting as a hobby, but then right around high school, for some particular reason, I don't know why, I got heavily involved in studying the like late modernist painters, like the New York school in particular, uh, which is kind of weird. But I always had a thing with the landscape because being in Canada, the group of seven is always like a specter in the background of any sort of endeavor in the art world, at least up until like I would say the past 20 years. But for me, it was still there. So then I, I'm basically like an autodidact. I just taught myself painting and then eventually printmaking. And uh, I started off like just with little experiments, like basically just LARPing, like just trying to cargo call um, the abstract expressionists and with like really cheap materials. But then eventually I worked my way up to conceiving myself as a landscape painter. And then from there, I just went into general expressionism, which I'm pretty much just for simplicity's sake. I call myself so that's how i got started with art i mean i thought about going to art school but the way the the schools are structured now um because i have a background in education and philosophy um it's kind of like not the point because so much of my work in both like the grad and post-grad stuff was so heavily orientated around art and aesthetic theory so it would almost be defeating the point and plus um, I just don't want to hang out with the people that go to art school. So that's kind of what it is. Um, yeah. And then, so the follow-up, I guess, is how I got started in, uh, what would you call these online the, spheres? Or? Yeah. The, the, these internet, this corner of the internet, I guess. That's actually heavily related to my story within, I guess you could say the arts. I started off. When I was in grad, I was in my MA program. Uh, I was a big fan. Uh, I was obviously like always on the right, but this was years and years ago. I started getting more interested in things like perennialism, the traditionalist school. And so the more you read thinkers like Gunyan and Evola, eventually you'll discover, you know, these creepy weirdo bloggers called Neo Reaction. Mm -hmm. um and so i started reading a lot of these people um not necessarily mold bug mind you but more of the people who let's call them thrown an altar side of nrx and eventually what happened was there was this very great video artist uh that was very popular in the chans 
called Nobody TM. And Nobody TM, the website is down, but you can, if you look hard enough, you can find different archives here and there. Basically, the last true video art that has a lot of different, um, not just political, like typical, like reactionary critique of modernity, but there's a lot of like Neoplatonism and a lot of different, um, almost I would say like Manichaean themes in these like very grainy, multiple no multi-layered video edits so i was fascinated by nobody tm and like there's a lot of music and apparently there was a whole group of people and just out of the blue i had this paper this term paper for this class that was on the frankfurt school and out of a sheer lark i happened to include at the end uh, a commentary about a little commentary about the works of nobody tm and it was uh, and then so i sent the essay just like randomly there was an email on the website. And I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to email nobody TM. And then eventually I struck a correspondence and nobody TM like, or well, the head editor loved the essay so much that it was featured on the main website. And then eventually if people remember, um, there was this website called West coast reactionaries that was run by Adam Wallace and Adam Wallace has since left as well, but he loved the essay because in it, I referenced this paper he did on nobody TM. And from there, that basically started my journey. The essay that if people know my work, people have probably read it. It's called Beholding a New Pale Horse about Foucault and modernity and the work of art and escaping um, like late capital and stuff like that. Uh, societies of control, basically. It's basically like me taking the Frankfurt School and taking Michel Foucault and doing this like crazy theory cell stuff. And so eventually I got from there, I went to... Um, which was more popular at the time because it was in direct competition with social matter was Thermidor magazine, which has also ceased to be as well. And so I always conceived of myself as a writer, but then eventually I started getting more involved in actually sharing my own artwork and going more into an art criticism direction with writing, which is kind of interesting because I'm, there's only like me and a handful of other people that do it. I mean, in the online right, there was always people that do things like film criticism and stuff like that. But when it comes to the fine arts, I feel like there's like me and a few other people and that's it. And so that's how my crazy journey sort of got started. And then eventually, like I wrote for other places and um, I have to actually get back into writing because I, I've written some more significant stuff on art criticism. Uh, but yeah, that's basically my journey. I, I, I started around Twitter around like 2015, 2016, when the quote unquote frog Twitter stuff started to become a thing. And so I've been there for like, as a lurker, at least I've been there for quite a while. Uh, so yeah. And so I, I guess the first wave of frog Twitter, I pretty much came in after that, you know, more or less. Yeah, no, it's always good to hear the deep lore because I really am a <laughs> relative newcomer, you know? And so um, it, it, it is always interesting for me to, you know, hear, all the different uh, publications and organizations and, oh, yeah. uh, di you know, and, you know, kind of, kind of backwaters of the internet where a lot of this stuff kind of grew up um, because, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people who are around in those days. And so I always enjoy hearing that, but yeah, I'm really glad that you're going that direction with what you're doing because, mm. you know, as I've said many times, I, I think it's something that uh, we desperately need and it's something that you know I just have no ability to do, but I but I think I think that's why it's really important to you know encourage and grow you know kind of that uh, that portion and that culture uh, around what's happening because without it I think uh, you know you really are in a bad great place and you just fall into this um, you know you're you're just another brand of of kind of pop culture without that yeah. you know you're, yeah. you're just a, a different flavor of remixing and recutting headlines um and and sadly that's where my skills lie so i'm not gonna lie to myself but i always want to promote so people funny, who have those other ways so, but it's so funny or how you have that self-reflexity to to realize that there are different levels like what you do is very like straightforward in terms of like you said the remixing and the cutting of headlines mm -hmm. and in the sort of more general or streamlined application like that, that, that in itself does a service the way that memes do a service, which I guess is the, sort of like the natural thing that we could talk about because a lot of this stuff, like having been around for a while, um, 
a lot of this grew organically out of forum culture, out of particularly my posting career, which is how since forgotten because Pleasure Man paywalled it. <laughs> and then, of course, Salo forums, where, you know, all of the greats of the early frog Twitter days, whether it's BAP, whether it's Menoquion 4, whether it's Hesperic to an extent, I think Hesperic was there. Um, they all came out of this, I mean, even Facebook, they basically came out of forum cultures and then they decided to move to Twitter to have a bigger audience. And so a lot of these organic concepts that we're dealing with, either politically or culturally, they they came in some way out of the chans, out of forums, out of like darkest, deepest pits, the deepest Africa of the internet. <laughs> and now, like just for example, the other day I saw this tweet from Benjamin Braddock that um, I won't say the words for YouTube, obviously, but it was the picture that it came from a my posting career thing about the way that the economy works with sort of, let's call it the um, global homogenous, uh, like econometrics of society. Uh, it was a call. It was called the, let's say the uh, SN cycle. And this post that blew up, it was amazing seeing like even people who are a semi normie, like learning about this deepest, darkest, uh, my posting career forum, post about how like the economy is for like minority um like in in sort of like the food the global supply chain of like food and resources and commodities you have like basically indentured slave immigrant workforce coming here to uh <laughs> to like butcher and fry the meats for um certain other populations in america to rack up like atrocious health outcomes and it's just, it's really funny when you see something from years ago that was like this little dark niche of the internet grow into this like mainstream narrative. I mean, even you said when you pointed out like Fox News is using terms like the cathedral, it's like what, what time frame are we living in, right? Like it's, it's quite fascinating. I guess meme culture has a way of doing that. Uh, it has a way of because there is no genuine underground anymore. I think that's the, the biggest problem is with the internet. There's sort of a flatness or a totality of discourse because even something that the way the internet is structured now, even the way that things used to be hidden on forums and Usenet sites and things of that nature. Now with the top five to become top four social media platforms, it seems that all discourse has been rendered transparent and even like the quote unquote normies can get woke on the uh, cathedral question or whatever. Right. So. Yeah. And I think that's also, I think you're right that, you know, because of the way the internet is now structured, that stuff is like right next to the checkout line, you know, when it used to be back <laughs> behind. Right. Exactly. You know, uh, and so you're right that I think a lot more people can pick that up casually. I think it's also uh, a fact that, you know, I think the, uh, you know, in, in, anyone who isn't completely 100% uh, down, you know, like the Lincoln Project rabbit hole, uh, even in uh, kind of the con ink sphere, knows mm. that they're running out of uh, of storylines. You know, they're running out of ways to, uh, you, you know, to new and novel ways to express what's going on. Um, they their their constituents are losing um, pretty much all faith in in kind of that Mitt Romney form of conservatism, mm. uh, and so they have to look outside. You know, for the first time in a long time, they actually have to make contact with their vanguard uh, because uh, I think they're all. I think there are a, a, a I think there are some people who are genuinely searching for something different. And I think there's also just some people who are in the system who just know they're out of fuel and they need to find right. it somewhere. And so they're much more willing to reach for those vanguard ideas in a way that you probably wouldn't have seen, you know, even five years ago. I mean, you you see, uh, you know, the discussions happening on Tucker Carlson, <laughs> uh, the, yeah. the types of language and verbiage they're using uh, two years ago, what would have gotten you banned off of, uh, you know, the internet yeah. gotten you, you know, uh, exiled from public life uh, for saying something like, you know, they're, uh, you know, anti-white hatred um, that would, that would have basically immediately signaled you as someone who's outside the Overton window and you never would have worked uh, in the industry again, even in the conservative news industry. Um, well, so I think you are seeing a, a pretty big shift there. Well, well, that's the thing. I think that, 
there's there's a sort of curse and a blessing there is mm-hmm. my point i think that the mainstream is out of mana they need a positron you know? <laughs> like the magic missile video a magic missile right like the, so they'll end up or rather let's say that i believe that one guy that worked for tucker he got that got doxxed by uh you know that organization oh yeah 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 he was like he actually was a mutual of mine believe it or oh, not was so, he? yeah um his name i forget his name but he that's an example i think of where fox news people will f- send their interns to uh darkest uh, corners of the internet and sort of mine content but the trade off being is that these concepts eventually when they hit the light of day they will ultimately become neutered and become sort of pastiches of themselves, which is ironic because that's exactly what Frederick Jameson said in his book, uh, Postmodernism, The Logic of Late Capital, is that there, as you collapse the high and low distinctions of culture, you get this pervasive flattening and commodification of all life. And I think the problem is that a lot of react, quote unquote reactionary right wing discourse, we're still subject to those same forces. But at the same time, I mean, it is good that certain people that have access to a more mainstream audience, especially an audience with resources like, you know, the boomers that watch Fox News, that they can look at things in a different way than your typical Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly that came before him sort of you know, American brand of conservatism, big box, you know, Walmart store books by Mark Levine or whoever. But, but then that begs the question, right? It's how culture gets infused into these more, you know, surface or latent level situations. For example, you mentioned the, um, the whole discourse around like the anti-white policies of critical race theory and so forth. Uh, the alternative right, as we know, is pretty much a dead entity. But these things never truly die in the sense that their discourses that were discussed on forums that could get you banned years ago, they become, how shall I pull it? put it, they become skinned of their sort of uh, more edgier qualities. Their edges become a bit, you know, rounded. And then they become more acceptable over time as the sort of chain of the constant news cycle and the happenings that go on become more insane and more craven and more desperate by as time goes on, then these concepts find more resonance with a greater amount of people. And I think, you know, when the left, when they, the bread tubers, for instance, when they talk about the radicalization pipeline, they're right in one sense, but they're wrong in the other. They're right in the sense that anything can sort of the, the more latent or like, opaque elements of any sort of political or ideological arrangement can become more mainstream over time. But they're totally wrong in the sense that, um, I don't know, you watch a Jordan Peterson video, eventually you're going to go to the Daily Stormer or something like that. It's just, there. there's a lot of complex cultural diffusions that have to happen in order for people to adopt a more, uh, let's say, for our purposes, a more you know, traditionally right-wing position because there's nothing new under the sun in my opinion, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I, but at the same time, like Tucker, he, um, I wanted to write something about it, but recently you, you watched the whole hungry trip, right? Do you know that one particular clip from, uh, the, you know, the guy that the, the beagle, whatever, not, not the one that splices the Tucker clips. Yeah. 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 Like Columbia bugle i think yeah yeah that one um so you saw the one where tucker talks about um like art and culture and architecture you know that Mm -hmm. one yeah when he gives the speech yeah right now for example five years ago you had like wrath of neon and other accounts that were essentially talking the same thing in more eloquent terms but it took until this point for the same amount of thinking in terms that the way that we conceive of authenticity when it comes to the political or the aesthetic sphere, when it comes to countering the narrative of like hypermodern neoliberal modernity, like the, the Maddie Iglesias bug man version of the world, mm-hmm. which is essentially just massification. When it says no, maybe when Tucker says no, maybe we have to stop. Maybe we have to have buildings that are quote unquote beautiful. And we can argue the definition of that. Obviously I have my own ideas, but to say that 
the aesthetics of a society are just as important as the big green line going up. I mean, that is, you know, ostensibly a radical position because you've never heard that level of critique before, you know, not even on Fox News, because they're still the ones that they have a more quote unquote conservative version of it, but they still believe that the green line should go up no matter what, just it's different. But now that people are realizing, even though it's such a basic and simple point, that perhaps this quest for infinite growth, either materially or virtually, is something that is going to condemn any civilization that holds on to the original values and will that made it great to begin with. It's kind of that's a basic point, but the fact that Tucker Carlson's willing to say that and to get attacked for it and to be called, you know, a f- not even just a crypto fascist, like a full on, you know, fascist for mm-hmm. it. Uh, by again, by the uh, bugocracy, if you will, then it is in some ways it's a positive sign, but in another way you have to realize that the the it's indicative of the exhaustion of mainstream discourse. I mean, as much as we make fun of people like William F. Buckley, and he was basically an infiltrator, let's face it, but. When you watch those old episodes of Firing Line, can you really think of mainstream television being on that level nowadays? Like even maybe Tucker Carlson gets a bit close, but it really is sort of the sign of the times that random Twitter anons can be quoted by, I think Fox News still is the number one news Oh yeah, station yeah. in America. Yeah. By the way, shout out to Bennett Demolich who got quoted by Tucker Carlson. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, Legendary. Yeah, no. So, so before we get ourselves too dirty um, uh, in politics, I do want to take a thread of what you were saying there, and and expand a little bit uh, on it because it's something that is probably obvious to a lot of people, and I'm sure obvious to you. But for a person like me, um, it, it was not necessarily obvious um, until you know really a few years ago. Um, the, you know the role of beauty uh like you said you know tucker giving that speech um that that maybe um efficiency isn't everything and mm-hmm. that we have to invest in you know some of what of what would be pro- productivity into beauty because if we don't uh we we suffer a cost Th- this is something that doesn't come to me naturally because i'm not an artist i like i i understand Mu- this musically because i came from a musical household mm. but i i didn't understand it with the visual arts and that kind of thing in the at the same way and so uh you know it, it wasn't too long ago five years ago I, yeah sure concrete buildings go for it whatever right like as long as i can get the most people into whatever and it makes the best you know uh you know uh spreadsheet numbers work then that's fine it, it wouldn't have something that immediately impacted me but i think uh, you know, c- kind of after some life events and and additional understanding of kind of the way uh, that this impacts us, it is something that even though I don't naturally understand, it is something that I'm kind of more awakening to. But can you talk a little bit um, maybe about why, you know, c- kind of that is so essential and why incorporating that into maybe where the right is going is, is going to be kind of key moving forward? Well, oh man, this is it's a huge. Yeah, I just <laughs> well, it's I was going to say it's probably the answer I would give is a bit more problematic, you could say, for the right wing than most people, because sure. I think I, I think that when it comes to the question of beauty, there is, in a sense, an immediate, transparent and disinterested notion of how people find beautiful things to be beautiful. There is, I would say, if you would go from, you know, the classic um, Kantian critique of judgment, disinterested notion of what makes the beautiful, there is an immediate gut instinct as to what we find to be aesthetically appealing. But when it comes to the issue of politics and culture and how you instantiate values, then something that can seem ugly or grotesque or abominable, in my opinion, could still be a sort of, let's say, second order beauty in a sense that it is 
relating to truth or relating to what we find to be a notion of at least a nominal and culturally contingent version of truth. I mean, I know this is very much a historicization of it because I, I still think that's important. I think that as much as we admire sort of universalization of thought and sort of uh, metaphysical values, which of course I believe in, I think that when it comes specifically to the aesthetic, then there is space for our notion of beauty being more nuanced than I would say kitsch or something like that, or something that is immediately centrally beautiful. Beauty has to come from a deeper commitment to an authentic and truthful self and being than something, you know, a bust of a Greek statue or some 19th century classical painting that, you know, academic painting that, you know, this is my critique. If you listen to my other uh, talks, for example, my more recent one with Russell Walter, it's great YouTube. He's just starting out in YouTube. Great channel. Uh, I talk about what a term I called vulgar tradism, where you have a very basic sense of like, well, this is trad. This is a girl in a wheat field, right? Like mm -hmm. those, those things are important. Obviously there, there has to be an art that celebrates our trans historical values, whether it's the family or religion or so forth. But the problem is that you get seduced into just another form of mediated kitsch, which can distract you from those values in pursuit of a mere sensuous beauty that in a lot of ways is counter to the aesthetics of hypermodernism, which we can get into whether it's flat design or whether it's like these abominable global homogenous art. But at the same time, the problem is that you're just falling into another form of kitsch that ignores the importance of these experiments within modern art that in a lot of ways were anti-modern. That's my whole point. There's a lot of modern art that is just as, uh, let's say, maybe not traditionalist, certainly, but just as metaphysical or trans-historical as anything else. It's just that when it comes to the stereotypical examples of like pointing to a Saitambi painting or saying like, you know, how ridiculous this Hockney doodle on his iPad is, I, I mean, that's very simple and it's very to the point but i think the problem with the right-wing approach to art has been this closing off of the possibilities that at least a lot of these modern art movements presented to people but like i mean like, i'm not ignorant of the fact that a lot of these modern artists they were you know commies and they had very terrible personal lives and all that but i think the problem when the discourse around beauty that we're talking about there are things that are beautiful to repeat myself, well, in fear of repeating myself, there has to be a deeper understanding of beauty than just what we think of as traditional painting or traditional aesthetics or even traditional music because it would rob us of an actual powerful counter narrative to what is allowable in the work of art nowadays. And so I think that's the problem with a lot of this discourse around beauty. So I, I, if that makes sense to you, Aaron, I don't know. No, it does. I, and I think a lot of that is reaction to the elite class and yes. knowing yeah. it's like, I know these people are my enemy. Yes. I know these yeah. people hate me. I know that they have, they desire something I would desire. So whatever they're producing must be tainted. Right. Um, and, and so that that's probably a decent instinct, but it's not, um, it's not going to serve you properly if, if you, I guess, if you want to explore everything and, and, and if you discard everything from that, then I guess that can be a, a downfall. But I was interested then, are you familiar with, with kind of Spangler's oh, yeah. uh, position here? Okay. So in that case, um, because this is, you know, the, uh, you know, as, as much as my limited knowledge is, this is certainly part of where it comes from. Do you, do you agree with him that, uh, you know, basically every culture is going to, you know, has this artistic uh, you know, movement tied to its metaphysical, you know, uh, drive and, and kind of its symbol. And that once that has kind of played out, there's no, like, it's just, you, you need something to collapse and something new to be born. Do, or do you think that you, do you think we're basically, we're the late civilizational man who cannot 
who who is trapped because they are too busy thinking about art to actually produce art or do you, hmm. do you think there is a, an option to break free of that without just a complete you know collapse and rebirth that's again that's another great question that that to me is left a field of what i researched for this stream so but i appreciate it. i love that i think spangler is 100 percent right in the sense that well, first of all, before Spangler, let me say that what you said before, it is true. A lot of it's terrible. I mean, mm -hmm. as as much as I love a lot of, for example, the German Expressionists or the New York School, then I mean, I know that like, you know, the CAA was at least partially involved in giving Pollock and de Kooning some money. I mean, I'm not, you know, I know that, but that's the classic critique. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot, believe it or not, a lot of the sort of modern right-wing critique of, for example, abstract expressionism came from like a lot of uh, new journalism, in particular, Tom Wolfe's book, The Painted Word. Like anything you hear about like money laundering and the sort of academic uh, selling art through words, that came from Tom Wolfe. And, and it was a good book. I mean, there is warranted critique. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Clement Greenberg's writing, but I do know that he was consciously trying to sell people on the idea of artistic modernism. But when it, but that's the side. Uh, when it comes to Spangler, in a lot of ways, I think that he preempted Heidegger's work on the actual origins of the work of art as being an interrogation and exposure of being. Now, this comes from the later Heidegger. This is his book, uh, Poetry Language Thought, where he talks specifically about how the work of art reveals being to us in ways that things can. So for example, he uses the famous um, painting by Van Gogh, sorry, Van Gogh, but you know, that's how they pronounce it of the worker's shoes, the field woman shoes, how this work of the absolute height of Van Gogh's artistic output was something so seductively simple and proletarian yet it reveals something about daily life in the context of how he painted these beat up worker woman shoes that it delivers us into a deeper truth about how the work of art can give us a picture of life itself. And this is what Spangler says. And, and again, Heidegger reverberated what Spangler said in terms of how he had these two concepts, the world and the earth. The earth is like the particular like bundle of facticities that, accompany any civilization the climate the uh the location time itself the world is what we create through our cultural output i mean i know i'm butchering this and if anyone's familiar with heidegger you know i'm butchering this but the work of art unites the world and the earth so for example he talks about the greek parthenon the parthenon unites greek civilization with their sense of self and with being itself because it is that which represents the height of Greece, the height of Athens, the height of their civilization. But it reveals to us a truth of sort of like post-civilization, post-Greek civilization. It reveals to us a truth about how the work of art dies because the context by which that work of art dies with it. So for example, he says the Parthenon becomes a museum piece. That's almost what Spangler kind of said, more or less in Decline of the West. Yeah, absolutely. You have, yeah, you have like works of art that express the being of a particular civilization. For example, the Song Dynasty Chinese Literati painting, which I studied very much uh, when I was in grad school. Um, but then by the time you have in Japan and China, you have the influences of Western culture. You have like Kabuki theater giving way like no theater giving way to Kabuki theater. You have different artistic outputs that are making its way to the East, the way that the East made its way to the West with Haponism. And a lot of the impressionists were influenced by, for example, these um, Ukiyo-e woodblock prints, which were itself a radical art form because they were basically like the form of uh, like commodif commodified artworks in like uh, Imperial Japan because they were like doing things like advertising theater and they're a big city, you know, they were kind of like the aesthetics of Tokyo and the big city and commodification and modernism, essentially pre, you know, modernism in the sense of they were expressing like more Westernized notions of entertainment and art and so forth. But then now we view Q woodblock prints 
as like quote unquote trad, even though that was like the thing that the merchant class endorsed to dissolve traditional power blocks of the shogunate. Right. So mm-hmm. then, but so, but this is the problem though, that like what we mean by trad. So the particular artwork of any civilization will go through a period of its infancy, its eventual spring ascendancy, and then eventually its decline and its death. And so every single generation from Heigl to Danto, we talk about the death of art, the death of painting, right? Mm. I mean, even nowadays people talk of it, like how like digital reproduction will destroy the work of art, which I think is total BS, but that's, there's an argument to be made there because we no longer have an artwork that is rooted to any particular civilization. So a lot of the art that we have nowadays is what um, the art critic uh, Thurston Botts Borstein called deculturation. So for example, Frederick Jameson says that postmodernism is like this acculturation, you know, culture becomes the death of ideology, the high art and low art become destroyed. And then we just have um, like the logic of like late capital reproduction influences everything and like now we have just pop culture right but nowadays we have like we're even beyond like postmodernism. we have deculturation where culture is just the mass the the sort of yeast life of you know mainstream popular entertainment it's not even something that is contextual to what we know as the west or the east or whatever it's just like this free-floating entity that is helped along by the global homogenous neoliberal order. And so this is, again, we're in this period that Spangler and Heidegger and to an extent Frederick Jameson talked about where art and culture become not only neutered of their vitality and their purpose to express being, because I truly believe that art, unlike anything else, unlike any other human endeavor, expresses the being of a civilization on a metaphysical level more than anything else. And I'm not, and of course I'm self-interested in that regard as an artist myself, but nowadays it's, it's very difficult to even make that claim because we can't really point to a single sort of milieu of art that can express our own cultural time period, because now it seems that, you know, the sort of end of history thesis has won in some respects Because there is no period. There's no, um, you can't say like for in the past you had in the 20th century, you had, you know, cubism, expressionism, you know, you can't say that there's an ism anymore because our art has been so thoroughly decultured that you can't really say, okay. I mean, to an extent you can, because there is things like post-internet art and whatever, what have you, but it's just like when it comes to what Spangler said, this is just natural progression. We're, we're in a time where the image and the aesthetic is all around us because of digital technology, yet the image and the aesthetic has become so thoroughly meaningless as it, to the point where it might as well not even exist. So, sorry, I'm just rambling right now. So. No, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I'm trying to, maybe it was Mark Fisher, but uh, but do you agree with uh, some people who said that it's the constant ability to experience all generations of culture uh, and all worldwide cultures simultaneously right now that keeps art from being produced and moving forward. Yes. hundred percent. And um, I think Mark Fisher talked a little bit about that in K punk and well, in his, his book on ontology, he talks a bit about that, but I think, I think it's true what Nietzsche said in The Birth of Tragedy, where he said that when it comes to high art, the cultures that were unilingual were the ones that produced the greatest works of art because when you only are dealing with very like locked away specific language haplogroups, when you're dealing with a civilization that contends with itself, then you have a common sort of understanding among people and you have a common referent that can create sort of more innovative forms of art and culture because everyone has the same sort of unconscious understanding. That's essentially what he said. But nowadays, I mean, people, people argue that the opposite is true, that eclecticism and like multicultural um, multiculturalism in all its forms 
on a deeper level can produce like, you know, interesting chimeras, but that's the problem. It only produces chimeras. It doesn't produce anything that is genuinely unique or interesting. I mean, even up right until the late 20th century, I would say you still had spaces for unique culture, but now that globalization through, you know, technology and the sort of pantheon of images that we're surrounded by all the time, uh, can we really say that this has been a, a heyday renaissance for the work of art? You know, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, I know I'm sounding like a basic trad, but it's the truth. I mean, in a sense, the sort of access to art movements and the access to images and the access to all cultures, or at least the, you know, trinket tourist version of them has benefited in some ways people who are more keen but for the vast majority of humans on the face of the earth that are consuming these cultural products, no, I would say it's been disastrous. I would say that I know it may come hypocritical because, you know, I'm not like the most, uh, I mean, skill is such a t difficult thing to quantify, but I think that there has to be some reintroduction of exclusivity, elitism, and the distinction between high and low culture in order to truly have a work of art that can thrive and can sort of express the being of a civilization. There is art that expresses what we, you know, the modern condition or rather the hypermodern condition. There is a lot of art that ex does that. But the, uh, the problem is the artist has to build from the ground up their own sense of enculturation and being that makes sense like they have to and, and so a book that i was heavily heavily influenced by and shout out to him uh i desperately wish to talk to him one day hopefully i'm on btr is the book by john david ebert called art after metaphysics everyone go and buy a copy uh that has informed my view of our criticism more than anything else because john david ebert he outlines um how the artist has to create their own world in the, the lack of any sort of cultural narrative in the absence of any metaphysical, um, like underlying metaphysical assumptions that hold a civilization together. The art, the artist is free, but the artist is condemned to that freedom to create. And so a lot of this like romanticism and existential crap, they don't realize the downside of that is that we live in a world where we don't have any common cultural or metaphysical reference and you're condemned to just becoming like a micro world onto yourself. And which is terrifying, actually. It's not something to be meddled with. It's again to reverberate Nietzsche. It's like what Nietzsche said about the last man or the ultimate man is that you're condemned to this freedom of having your little pleasures in the day and your little pleasures at the nighttime, right? And there's nothing noble about the sort of uh, Maddie Iglesias bug world, you know, all cultures colliding into one and you get to choose which level of high fructose corn syrup cultural commodity that you can buy in any given circumstance. It's really, um, it's actually hell actually, when you think of it, it's, 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 mm. it's really satanic in my opinion. It's satanic in the sense that we believe we have agency over everything that makes us a human to begin with. That, that is the problem with modern art and aesthetics and culture is that we believe that we have agency over the very things that used to give us meaning themselves. And uh, sorry, go ahead, Oren. I'm, I'm, no, I'm no, no, you're fine. I was just, right now. I was just going to say that that's, uh, you know, that echoes a lot of what C.S. Lewis said in, oh, yeah. uh, in, in, um, uh, uh, book I cannot suddenly remember. Um, but, uh, but letters? no, no, no. Uh, the, uh, the one where he's talking about the the book that they the the guys are draining all of the abolition of man. The, um, yeah, the abolition of man. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and he says, you know, as soon as you have that generation that completely materializes and completely controls and manipulates every aspect of what makes you human, those are the last generation of men. That that yes. the, that the abolition of men because whatever comes after them is no longer fundamentally human by, by, by gaining control over everything that makes you who you are, you have completely destroyed. Right. Well, the, you know, the ability to continue uh, mankind uh, as it was. So 
what I'm interested then is, and I know this is, you know, as always, predictions are dangerous. Uh, mm-hmm. But from the artistic perspective, like I know, obviously, you know, we talk about this socially and politically and such, but but from the art, from kind of the art and culture perspective, do you think then that we're looking at a situation where uh, eventually the Tower of Babel just falls and then mm-hmm. the shatters and all these cultures can return to the land and kind of build themselves separately again? Or do you think uh that we're more of an looking at like a landian thing where like either you reinvent it entirely or it just doesn't like the nature of art uh shifts entirely or we're just you know uh without it or we're just going to continue uh kind of in this unrooted version uh going forward i i think that we're going to experience the latter for quite a for quite some time, but mm-hmm. I do see that people have a hunger for their unique and cultured expressions. But when it comes to, for example, land, I, I'm thinking of uh, who's that one YouTuber? It's like a group of people. They have like this really kitschy, blocky um, aesthetic animation, and it's like I effing love science stuff. Kurt oh, Sigard, yeah. uh, Okay. Yeah, it's something like that. Kurt Sigard something. Uh, I'm not super familiar with BreadTube. I know some people. Are no, it's not BreadTube. Bread it's like oh, this okay. pop science YouTube channel. Oh, okay. That's like gets millions of views. Uh, it's like some Scandinavian or Swedish name. And they have like these really kitschy, um, like neon colored animations. Uh, they had this one video I remember about how the work of art will disappear because robots will create art that's better than humans or some some silly, ridiculous, materialist, spiritually insectoid version of that. I think people truly believe that we've moved beyond um, the need for the work of art. Some people, at least. Some very spiritually small-souled type of people. But I do think that when things become more chaotic and when people are going to lose their cultural understandings, then you will see people trying to build anew, at least in sort of marginal and fugitive senses, the way that the online right has managed to harness like me magic or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that don't get like, don't kid yourself here. When people they you know, lament this thing about postmodernism, that's to me, that's BS in the sense that we live in a world of hyper modernity. Postmodernism has sort of come and gone because what we see now is an imposition of a meta narrative that is more vast and totalizing and punishable by the offense of, you know, unpersoning than anything else in human history, in my opinion. Even worse than any sort of heliocentric European Christian dumb, the power over people's minds have become immense by this particular meta narrative that we're experiencing. So, but when it comes to the work of art, let me give you an example. This is the first chapter of the book by Frederick Jameson, Postmodernism, where he has this brilliant passage on, um, you know, that one painting by Edvard Munch, The Scream, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. That That is, to me, because I, I'm such a big fan of Edvard Munch in terms of what I do with painting and what I do with printmaking. He was also uh, doing things like wood, woodcut printmaking. The Scream to Frederick Jameson, he has this brilliant point about how the scream is like the absolute apex, the absolute top, the last representation of high modernism. Not in the high modernism of like I effing love science and human progress, but the the ability of the modern to engage the self contra the self in the sense of the scream embodying, you know, anime and existential angst and our desire for transcendence that's been uh, interrupted by like, you know, our technological modern hellscape where the self has to confront itself. That's the essence of the scream. And so Frederick Jameson says that was the last work of modern art because it has the sense of like the modern obsession with psychoanalysis and, and uh, the, the self is clearly something that's there. It's man confronting the self in ways that could never be expressed. For example, in uh in in like titian's time it could be expressed with goya but that's a different thing 
Um, but with Edvard Munch's The Scream, what happened after that is what Frederick Jameson calls the descent into postmodernism or postmodernity, where the self has been obliterated. There is no self. The self becomes another uh, subject of like the totality of commodification becomes this like collapse of what we even know the self to be. The self becomes this very sinuous, rhizomatic, fibrous thing, like collection of affects that are bought and sold. And, you know, I mean, basically what the modern subject is now is kind of like postmodern, but kind of not because people, they say like, well, for example, the, the picture of subjectivity that the global homogenous order wants to push on us. It is postmodern in the sense that you can buy and sell your own identity and your own gender and so forth, but it's still there, there's still a totalization there. There still is a meta narrative. I would say it's like politically secular Gnosticism. But what Frederick Jameson saw with postmodernity is that there's no self, like it's very much like you know Michel Foucault or Derrida, that the self is gone. The self is is um, a collection of like affects that come together and then fall apart. So we've been through all of that. And the scream was like the last picture of the modern man, like screaming into the abyss of his own self. But what we have now, which is curious though, is that we went through this phase of like, Oh, the postmodern self, there is no such thing as the self, man. It's all just power. Nowadays we have this clever hyper modern reintroduction of the self in the aesthetic and the cultural and political sense of the human subject, because now the global homogenous order is now telling us that, yeah, the self is real, but the self is something that we dictate through hyper political ideological aspects of what we even know to be modern existence. Right? So Frederick Jameson says that in post-modernity, like ideology is destroyed. It's ultimately capitalism because, you know, he's a Marxoid, right? Um, but nowadays, can we say that there still is like this total obliteration of ideology? No, it's not because ideology is what makes the modern essential self. The mm -hmm. modern political left still believes in an essentialism. They, they just have a way of disguising that essentialism. This is why I think the conservative... Uh, right wing attack on post modernity is sort of like a wrong headed thing because where is this great post modernity? Where is this fibrous self? Where where is this sort of free play expression that even Frederick Jameson saw had aspects of a reactionary like like a backdoor reactionary? Um, let's say uh, how how do you put it? There were elements of postmodernism that could bring a sort of reactionary quasi-fascistic politics through the back door, right? Because he, remember, even this is what Deleuze said, even the fascists had a um, an eminent rhizomatic way of conducting the war over the self, even though there was still a rigid hierarchy. There was aspects of what, you know, the Deleuzean, Guattarian, like, you know, rhizome and stuff like that there was still like a collapse of the meta narratives of like liberal enlightenment modernity. Right. There was still like this react, like even within the heart of reactionary thinking, there is elements of post-modernity in that because we're rejecting the meta narrative of liberal, uh, like post enlightenment end of history, liberalism. But nowadays this whole thing, like the Jordan Peterson, Oh, well it's postmodern Marxism. Where is the postmodernism? Where in fact our sense of self whether it be through gender or race or whatnot that's even more essentialist and even more reified than ever it's like they're like postmodernism became inconvenient for the like global homogenous empire so we had to get rid of it and but of course like conservatives are always late to the party right, so they're like yeah. oh well, it's postmodernism man Sorry, I'm just ranting right now. No, 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 yeah, attacking the enemy 20 years after it's moved on to something else. <laughs> like, but, no, yeah. literally 30 years, yeah, 30 yeah. years. Because postmodern, like the 80s, that was, a you could argue, was the, the sort of apex of postmodernity. Right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah, sorry. So the, the, the thing I wanted to pull out of there, the thread I wanted to pull out of what you're saying there, because I've, uh, I've heard you express sentiments like this before, and this is very similar mm. uh, to what one of my friends, the distributors, has said a number of times. Uh, uh -huh, which uh -huh. is that uh, you know the postmodernism always uh, should have been a reactionary 
um, movement or should the react, reactionaries always should have picked up on uh, postmodernism. But since we are at, since we are kind of a, a now attacking the the popular Jordan Peterson formulation, let's actually get a definition because I think it's so rare that oh, someone God. actually stops to do this. And and we, yeah, I know that there, again, it could be anything. But what is postmodernism? Both both you know in in an artistic sense. Is it only in an artistic sense? Is that the only place it belongs? Is it also something social or, or philosophical? Like, mm. what what do we actually mean here uh, when we're saying postmodern? Well, like, that, that's one thing. I mean, you could get a million different answers by sure, a million sure, sure. different people. I mean, there there's even, like, um, I mean, there's great articles and YouTube videos, unfortunately, by, you know, by soy jack uh, theory cells on youtube that are part of <laughs> affiliated with red tube but i would say that it's interesting how you asked if there it's just merely aesthetic and cultural but if there's a political aspect to it because someone before the stream asked me um if like there's this debate within sort of studying postmodernism whether it's frederick jameson's definition of being a pure commodification of culture and art that then has some political implications because you have to remember, like if you're a Marxist, you still hold on to this like suspicion of post-modernity because you have, you still have this, like maybe ideology can come through the back door and maybe the revolution can still, you know, go on. Right. But then you have other thinkers like uh, Perry Anderson who talks about how there are elements of anti-modernism within post-modernity. And he talks about the, uh, that college up in Pennsylvania, what was it called? Uh, Black Blackstone or Blackwell College, you know, where all the hit, the beatnik poets went and you had people like uh, Rauschenberg interacting with John Cage and all that stuff. And so I, I agree that post-modernity has to do with culture, politics, aesthetics, and philosophy. Um, now, in terms of definitions, I mean, the general sense is that it's a rejection of modernist meta narratives and structuralism. It's like the uh, cynis cynical, quasi nihilistic, um, eclecticism, celebration of eminence as opposed to transcendence, because even um, high modernism and liberalism has elements of the human condition being overcome through our own like power of like utopian intellect and, and pr progress and all that crap. It's a supreme sort of skepticism. It's, it values things like uh, sort of uh, let's say the breakdown of ideology, the breakdown of commonly held definitions of what it means to engage in sort of uh so, like the sort of reference that every civilization holds dear. Like, for example, we live in the quote unquote West. That's obviously a construct they would say. Um, and so, the, but that doesn't really, that's just like the surface level definition of what postmodernity is because people even argue over whether we even had postmodernity to begin with. Right. But if we're just going with definitions, then I think that, you could say that it's a rebellion against the particular meta narrative of post enlightenment, rational, utopian, liberal society. That could be a good, you know, definition. And then later on, you could say that post structuralism, with uh, thinkers from like you know Derrida and Foucault and so forth, that they had a hand in undermining the sort of uh, classical narratives of the age of reason itself. So, and, and there was always reverberations of it, even within the work of art. I mean, you could say that Goya was the first modern painter, but it had elements of the rejection of like the quote unquote traditions of modern painting itself. Right. Like you, even, even modern art had tr like, you know, became reified to a point where it became a tradition. Like, you know, like, like for example, in post-modernity, you could have, the reintroduction of things like representation and, you know, figure painting and so forth, rather than like the orthodoxy of the six of the fifties and sixties, which was, um, you know, abstract expressionism and so forth. So for example, Andy Warhol is considered like the first quote unquote postmodern artist because he's dealing with this like collapse of high and low culture. He's dealing with things like mechanical reproduction in the work of art as opposed to this sort of uh, need for like the authentic immediate expression of the artist that the modernists held dear, 
you know, in, in some sense, a lot of his screen printings, there is there is no sense in which Andy Warhol himself, the man, or rather the imagio of Andy Warhol, actually like touched the image in terms of like this thing called the, you know, aura, the essence of the painting. It's like Jackson Pollock, the way he like danced around the canvas and, you know, he really threw the paint down in different ways. It's like that is his immediate expression. It's like cataloging his every movement. Whereas with Warhol, that's like the total opposite. You could like look at one screen printing by Andy Warhol and there literally is like no sense that he was the one that was doing it, if that makes sense. Because a lot of like the notions of art, the work of art in post-modernity has to do with how we approach things like what we mean by the quote unquote authenticity of the artist, right? They don't believe in that crap. They think that, you know, things are constructed to such an extent that the issue of like, oh, well, I'm painting and it's my painting and I have an ownership over it because I'm the one that has this particular way of, you know, delineating brush strokes. It's like they don't, there's a lot of ambiguity. That's ultimately what postmodernism is. It's the ambiguity of what we even mean by things like culture and art and politics, right? And in a way, you could say that the, the regimes in the 20th century, I know this is a wild radical claim, I'm so maybe you should stop me here. But you could say that, for example, Benito Mussolini was creating somewhat of a postmodern regime in the sense that the work of art is politics itself. It's what it's what Benjamin said. It's the um, it's not like the communists who would take aesthetics and politicize them. It is rather the aestheticization of politics. It is all of society, like that one painting by the Italian futurist, I forget which one, where the image of Benito Mussolini is on the Italian landscape. The face of the fascist regime regime becomes the work of art itself upon the society that they have commandeered. Oh my god, that's oh I'm I'm just I'm jerking myself off right now intellectually, <laughs> so you should stop me right now. My it's god. become obscene, Gia. It's, it's, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so <laughs> So here's something I want to ask you then, because uh, uh, James Lindsay. Uh, oh, uh, oh God. I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I, I'm sorry to besmir besmirch you by discussing this, but uh, but I couldn't. I couldn't help myself after kind of your last uh, your last little bit there. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lindsay uh, went on kind of a, a tirade and blocked a bunch of people, and his, oh, yeah. his main thing was uh, that uh, there's this wave of trads uh and and specifically he called out neo-reactionaries that mm -hmm. are postmodern, and we uh, have to yeah. resist these postmodern trads and these postmodern neo-reactionaries uh because they are a they're a danger to uh everything we hold dear um which i think confused a lot of people um uh but what do you think do you think he's accurate in assessing things like <laughs> neo-reaction in the current traditional movement as postmodern, are they a threat to what he believes? Uh, and and if mm. and if these movements are postmodern, what should those who consider themselves on the right or opposed to progressivism take from postmodern postmodernism? What are the lessons they should learn? Well, <laughs> it's so funny because I was talking about this stuff in like 2015. Um, that's why in my Twitter bio I say postmodern, right? Because that's to me it's an easy like shorthand. For, I'm looking um, these up for you, Gio. Don't worry. Yeah, no, I know it's amazing. <laughs> um, this is why, like, I we tried to work desperately to get James Lindsay on BTR, but he won't do it. He won't debate Alice Kashuda. Um, so I think that in in a sense, yes, only partially. I think that there are elements of post-modernity in the modern, let's say, dissident, right? Just, I mean, there are some people like my friend James, uh, my friend Josh Neal that think that there is no such thing as the quote-unquote DR. But I think that just as a, a an easy heuristic, let's just call it the dissident right, which includes neo-reaction. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that unfortunately, the formalism of people like Moldbug I, mean, I hate I hate to insult your boy, but I think That's that right. you can have your swing at him. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think that they still consent tacitly to um, a lot of assumptions of liberal modernity. I think mm -hmm. that they basically, in some ways, certain neo reactionary figures, they basically like we want our own like based and red pilled version of neoliberalism. Unfortunately, but no, I, I think do... I think that's an absolutely fair. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. 
But when it comes to conservatives, when it comes to James Lindsay, when it comes to the Fox News people, maybe apart from Tucker Carlson, I mean, these these people are modernists. They 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 believe in the progress of the modern world. They believe in the project of the post enlightenment. Uh, what post enlightenment rationality can give us? They are thoroughly moderns. They are frustrated moderns. Unfortunately, I mean, William F. Buckley he started this trend. I mean, when you see James Lindsay, you you should really watch Firing Line. Watch the Firing Line with William F. Buckley, this one writer who wrote, um, I think the book was called The Liberal Crack Up, and a young Christopher Hitchens, a, a young, less grizzled Christopher Hitchens that recently arrived from England. That episode, it's almost like watching James Lindsay argue with uh, some liberal on CNN. I mean, that's what it is. But I think that there are elements, the, the lessons that the right can learn from postmodernity, in some ways are organic in the sense that we are challenging the prevailing meta narratives of our civilization. We are in a lot of ways, the like subversive rhizomatic agents of a purely, you know, smooth space nomad. But unfortunately, I mean, I wouldn't go so far into these romantic notions of we are the true nomads. We are the true war machines. We are the real delusions because in, in a lot of ways we still are subject to the forces of modern hypermodernism, like everybody else, we can't kid ourselves of that. We can't kid her. We can like um, delude ourselves into thinking that maybe our threat to the power structures are more potent than they actually are. But in the sense, James Lindsay, when it comes to his critique, I think that he's deeply afraid because it's kind of true. We kind of are postmodern right wingers in the sense that we don't conform to a lot of these would have become the orthodox notions of conducting political discourse. And James Lindsay is terrified of this. He's terrified of the sense of maybe it's not true that we have a common collective cultural or ethnic or racial or religious understanding, but that through the um, postmodern aesthetics of being, we can rebuild these things in a nominal sense. And so James Lindsay is like, no, that's even more terrifying than some gender studies major doing like uh, some performance with bodily fluids or whatever. Right. Like it, it's just, mm. I think they're terrified for a reason now, whether we can call it like postmodernism, I mean, that's kind of, that's uh, in a sense, it's a stretch, but in a sense, it's kind of true. So maybe James Lindsay should be afraid. I don't know. Well, that's, well it's funny. Cause this is always the, you know, this is always their last argument, right? This yeah. is their, their final argument is, is, they'll always say things like yes the uh you know the inability to do arithmetic because two plus two is now six is bad right, right. um and 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 you know only and we're we're going back to segregation because of the the new uh racial theories being taught and uh based we can't, we can't, oh, yeah, right, yeah but <laughs> but but you know like like this is they'll say like all that stuff's bad but their final argument and james Lindsay's final argument is right. always and if you do this, eventually a real right wing will show up, right? That's yeah, what they're that's always what we, saying is, yeah. is, is cause it's never like, Oh, the thing you're doing is like completely deeply moral, morally horrible. Like it might be an inconvenience. It might make doing right. medicine hard or something, but the thing you really need to worry about is at the end of the day, this could bring a real reaction. This could bring a real, uh, uh, uh um, opposition to, and well, then you'll the be worried. But again, that's exactly what people like Frederick Jameson said with postmodernism is that if you don't nip it in the bud now, eventually you can have this sort of backdoor reactionary politics mm -hmm. that could come out like can come out of left field and then it's over. Right now we are back to like, I don't know, some form of like crypto fash or whatever. But even even the way that um I, I think you you asked the question about beauty before, and usually people they will point to, and I know Bap, he's a fan of this, would point to uh, that one particular essay by Susan Sontag about the um, how basically like loving beautiful things makes you a fascist, right? Hmm. Um, in the sense, I think that essay becomes problematic in the sense that um, the 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 sort of let's call it the global homogenous empire is adopting. Uh, notions of kitsch and beauty and the sublime for their own ideological purposes. And 
we no longer have a monopoly on things that people consider quote unquote beautiful. I mean, a lot of it is terrible and ugly and dehumanizing and the humans of flat design are basically like a political weapon that has been born out of things like, um, you know, post impressionism and uh, cubism and so forth. But when you really look at it, I mean, a lot of this sort of like kitschy sentimentalism is becoming a tool of global empire, of the political left or whatever you want to call it, the the sort of, uh, you know. And so James Lindsay, that people like him and Jordan Peterson and so forth, they come along and they critique the right wing as being like, oh, well, you know, you're postmodernist now and all this crap. Um, it, 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 it's in a way it's like, it's, uh, it's denying the actual truth of it. Right. Like it's, it's a purposeful distortion on their part, but in a way it's a distortion that has some truth to it. It's like, it's an unintentional truth of people like James Lindsay to point this out. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, I wrote my notes here. I talked about how, um, if you compare Jameson in the book on postmodernism to what Nick Land said, um, you're well aware of the fact that Xeno systems have come out in PDF, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I've yeah. been I've been uh, screenshot sharing uh, different yeah. portions. Yeah. The number two in Xeno systems, I think it was either two or three, the blog posts, where Nick Land said that um, traditionalism is the sort of past utilizing making a war upon and enslaving both the present and the future yeah you yeah you, yeah he's using each yeah. one of these movements and comparing them to, to like what section of time they're right unifying. yeah yeah progressivism is the opposite it's the you know futurism and progressivism but however i do think that there is a base trad and red pill futurism uh but futurism for convenience sake is the enslaving and destruction of the past and present in service of the future. But what Nick Land says is that nowadays we have the worst, the absolute worst of both worlds. We have an eternal present that enslaves both, enslaves and erases, by the way, both the past, which is obvious, because anything beyond the 1960s is verboten and anathema, but also erases the future which is even more interesting. So post-modernity, people would say, is what we have now. But in reality, I would say that it's more of a hyper-modernity that erases the the future. Hmm. Because at least within post-modernity, there is like some inkling that a form of futurism can, you know, rhizomatically break away from the plane of imminence and, you know, do all that, you know, flowery theory cell language to describe you know essentially breaking into the future through a seismic rupture whether it's cultural or political or whatnot right but now what we have is the denial of any possibility of rupturing into any future or any return to the past we have an eternal present that has wiped away all cultural distinctions and has fulfilled the promises of this sort of like enlightenment instrumental reason to police all of life and including our notion of the self and make of it this like what i guess we call in reactionary spaces like the gray goo of being you know like that's you know patrick denine right like uh Mm -hmm. it's not that liberalism failed it's that liberalism you know was too effective yeah it got exactly what it wanted yeah exactly so james Lindsay is just as much a product of the gray goo fox news conservatism in America, at least, and in Canada, let's. I I don't have a distinction between Canada and America, obviously. Um, <laughs> you guys make a you guys make a fine hat, and that's, yeah, well, yeah. Canada really is the petri dish of <laughs> it's any true. social experimentation that will infect America eventually. Um, but in a way, like that type of conservatism, that type of discourse, that is just as much a product of the present destroying both the past and future than anything else. I mean, as hard as it, you know, because I started off when no, I was I've... very young as, you know, an army conservative, right? Like my first red pill was uh, reading America Alone by Mark Stein. Uh, but James Lindsay, I think he knows that. He's smart enough to know that if you destroy any cultural, political, um, how shall I say, any project which doesn't maintain 
the narrative of, well, the enlightenment is Western and that's the best because we're exceptional then. And then of course, you know, America is exceptional by extension because it's the ultimate enlightenment Petri dish. Uh, any project from both the left and right that can challenge or problematize that to James Lindsay is like, you know, these evil postmodernists that want to destroy my precious uh, capitalist liberal modernity. I mean, that's yeah. No, I've said I, something very similar yeah. about Eric Weinstein. You know, people oh, be like, oh worse, yeah, Weinstein's example. right on this or that, and I'm like, no, yeah. Weinstein is policing his radicals to make sure they don't boil the frog too quickly. Right. Uh, right. He he's not on your team. Like he 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 is worried that you will eventually take over. That's why he's beating back the crazies on his, in, in his far corner. Oh, exactly. Um, Cause yeah. he's, he's worried that, that they're going to put his, uh, his worldview in, 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 uh, in danger. He's, he's not there to defend you. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but that said, uh, we're, we're over an hour here and we do have oh, some wow. questions stacking up. Yeah. I, I could do this all day. This has been really oh, interesting, yeah. but, uh, but I do have to, go ahead and start getting into our questions here. If you have any questions for Gio or myself, you can go ahead and put them in now. We'll make sure to get to them here. Our first one is from, let me see, uh, from Nick Larson here for $10. Thank you very much, Nick. Mm -hmm. He says, pretty blackpilled on new Amazon Lord of the Rings series. Oh, God. Do you think oh. there's any chance it would elevate objective truth, beauty, goodness, etc.? Oh, Oh, buddy. Or will they just uh, deconstruct attack Tolkien's worldview? Uh, Geo, go ahead. I have thoughts as well. I, oh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, but I, I think that it's very interesting when you approach the based in red pilled authors. I think that if it can steer young children towards the actual works of Tolkien, that it could maybe be good. But it's not going to get to that level. I'm pretty blackpilled in this because they have an ability to sort of take what is deemed quote unquote problematic cultural outputs and, and franchises and distort them to the point of being not only unrecognizable, but sort of salting and gaslighting the ground from which, yeah, salting the earth and gaslighting people um, from which those original franchises stood. Like, for example, I saw. This article, and um, by the way, Mel Magazine's like the absolute worst abominable millennial like theory cell drag, right? Like a pretend theory cell. It's like BuzzFeed with more verbiage. This article today in Mel Magazine about how like The Sopranos is embodying um, something about like queer male identity or some crap. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. Yes. Because it's like what Bap, you know, Bap said about how like male friendship is always viewed through this like hermeneutics of suspicion. But I mean, even like how <sighs> I'm not even going to get into it, but yeah, I'm pretty black pilled in the Lord of Rings series. I think that they can take a lot of medieval or fantasy narratives that rely heavily upon the bonding and the, um, the bonding of male friendship through a warrior cast. And they can like apply this very like misinterpreted, like Mary beard Hellenism towards it, where they're basically all, you know, you know what, right. Uh, but what are your thoughts on it? Or, I'm curious to know. Uh, yeah, they're going to, they're going to murder this and swear it's skin uh, and mock oh, you with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, there's the problem for this series is that because it's already um, remaking something that is a beloved property that was mm -hmm. more or less, accurately done by jackson previously the only place it can go is woke there's there's just yeah. no other place for it to go it it's not going to get more traditional right like that's clearly not where they're going to go and they're not going to just redo the jackson stuff um so the only place for it to go is to make it about the themes they want to make it about there's there's literally nothing else they can do and they've been pretty explicit about this already oh, right? yeah. like they've already said that hey we're going to put like explicit material and stuff in here and so um no i i think that uh whatever this is it will not be lord of the rings it will have some yeah. of the names it will it will it will take place in some of the places that are listed uh, but it will have been completely gutted of anything yeah. uh, that that was actually. By the way, I got to have a bone to pick actually with the distributist. Mm. And he's been on the show. I've talked to him. He's a great guy. But his recent, not his most recent video, but his video on 
arts and culture. I think that to look for any meaning in like pop, like sci-fi and fantasy franchises, especially with like the sci-fi writers they have nowadays, I, I think is a fool's errand. I think that as much as sci-fi and fantasy has evoked the imagination of young men in particular, um, these fields, in, in my opinion, and I'm saying this as someone who's like not as much of a fastidious reader in like fi- sci-fi or fantasy, with the exception of a few things, I think that's a you're not going to find meaning in it. You're not going to like find a based in red pilled version of Star Wars. I'm sorry, I hate to say it. Maybe Robert Heinlein, but that's pretty much the closest you can get to a based in red pilled. Um, because sci-fi from its beginning was like this weird progressive modernism. I mean, even Asimov with his neurodivergent listing of different worlds and, and uh, psycho history and so forth. I, I think, I don't mean to insult people, obviously. I think that you could probably produce sci-fi. <clears throat> oh, I'm getting hoarse here. Um, You could produce sci-fi that could have a like vision of futurism that is much more in service to our goals but the way to go about that can only come organically. It can't like, this is my problem. I think with that distributors video is that you can police a franchise and a mythology all you want, but that's not the way that these franchises and these like well-known um, artistic outputs come about. Like that's certainly not the way that Tolkien came about. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, so we're kind of having to build these things from the ground up, but to look at like, you know, oh, what about Narnia? What about Tolkien? What about this and that? I mean, sci-fi and fantasy, they are largely just the products of the culture industry now. I hate to say it, but even Tolkien's going through this. Yeah, uh, I think... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think one of the things <clears throat> that uh, guys like me and the distributors can run into is... Um, distributors is probably more creative than I am, but we're just not in our core, like, culture creators, right? Right. And, and, right. and that's which means that when people ask us for solutions like that, we're reaching in for tools we don't necessarily have. And, and it feels, right. and, and it's rough because you know, this stuff needs to get made, you know, it needs to get produced, you know, it's essential and you know, you can't do it. And so, but, but because you're uh, like a, a voice in the community, people turn to you. And this is why I always tell people like, please like don't rely in, on your content creators for everything because um you know that's just not always their skill set the the things that brought them to your attention uh in this kind of modern right. environment are not the things that build what you need um well even even someone like um like zhp who is a great friend of ours mm-hmm. um i think that when i read a lot of his short stories um he's doing theory fiction in i think ways that speak to our own condition, but they are still possibilities. They're not creating. And I think that he would say this as well, that he's not trying to create a universe unto itself, but rather he is creating a picture of possible futures that have a pretty big resonance with a lot of the common trends and themes that we're experiencing in our own world. Now, is there a sense of redemption in those works? I struggle to find it. And it's something that I would want to talk with him about more in depth. But I think that if you're going to look at a sci-fi person that is necessary, and I'm just saying this because he's my friend, but I think that even though ZHP's works are more necessary than ever, um... I, I I don't think that they would inspire the same things that Tolkien inspired, nor should they. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to a cartography of possible futures, I think he does it better than anyone. I think that the majority of sci-fi that gets written and approved in the most mainstream of channels, I mean, I I mean, people that know they know it's it's terrible, it's garbage, it's uh that who's that Ahmed guy? I don't know. Like these, it's all just like the publishing industry in general is just um in terms of you know fiction is just oh my god. 
run by the worst people. I mean, the art world is run by the worst people ever. Uh, but, I hate uh, to break yeah. it to you, but almost everything currently is run by the worst people. The worst people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. That's kind of an institutional cross uh, right. you know, problem. Uh, but yeah, let's move on to our next one. Thank you again, Nick. Uh, Eaton Marks says the dominant style of graphic design in the current regime is very minimalist, includes all the flat stuff. Geo, in your opinion, what does a right wing alternative to this style look like? Thank you for your donation, man. What do you think, Geo? Flat art? What's what's the right wing alternative? What's um when it comes to Eli Schiff's concept of humans of flat design, to me it's a revolutionary way of picturing the it's a way of figuring what we're actually experiencing in terms of a meaningful discourse. So we know the problem. We know that flat design is an aesthetic hell that has been inflicted on us by our usually Silicon Valley cultural overlords. But my fear is that when it comes to a right-wing alternative, obviously like psychomorphism is the obvious choice because it's returning to a more like, holistic like natural like realism based approach to design my fear is that people are going to like devolve into like graphic design kitsch for lack of a better word they're going to like look at norman rockwell or something like that i think that design and illustration should find some threads that can service what we're experiencing nowadays like for example i'll give you an the example I'm thinking of would be like, um, and I know a lot of like very uh, left wing, like bread tube people are interested in this. But if you look at like the aesthetics of the early internet, you look at things like Y2K, you look at things like um, how people could endlessly customize and create their own aesthetic output with each like GeoCity site, and even to an extent MySpace. I mean, it's very interesting how flat design has obliterated that ability to customize our own aesthetic experience. What would be an alternative would be a return, not a return, but rather a way of breaking ourselves free of flat design proper. Now, I don't know what that would look like, but to me, it would have to incorporate some element of futurism the way that the Y2K aesthetic had mm. in the sense that Y2K was an envisioning of the future that was pure and transparent and mosaic and, and something that if you look at like any brace 3d graphic, I mean, there's something almost mystical about it, at least to me. Unfortunately, I think that any alternative from the political right that could rival that of sort of flatness of not just like the interface of websites, but also like, the, the the global homogenous vision of the human itself being this blobby, weak, pastel neon, uh, shapeless, gooey entity. I mean, maybe it's just as simple as like portraying the human as being an object of veneration again. Like I'm not talking like some ridiculous, you know, although I do love him immensely, but people like, uh, I'm seeing recently people um, admiring the works of Frank Frazetta, for instance. I think it doesn't have to be like that much. Like you don't have to like design the human like as a digital giga Chad, but I do think that you would have to have something that is in a way venerating the human subject that isn't going to lend itself to being this homogeneous cog blob entity that is um in a way a post-humanism in a way a gnostic post-humanism because to me when i think of humans of flat design and eventually i want to write a book on it along with um what i call neoliberal catch i see this like almost like this form of like secular gnostic aesthetics of like while the human subject has now reached its total form in the gray goo in the neon pastel can't be a goo of a human subject now now we've moved beyond the human subject now we become these entities that pop out of the screen and 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 totally flat 2d visage and they're like uh they they cease to be what we know as human um whatever can be against that i guess you would say could be potentially like reactionary or whatnot 
Mm-hmm. But, but I, again, this is very complicated because I really don't have a good answer for it. I think no. that they want to totalize this aesthetic, obviously. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. All right, so we've got another question from Nick Larson. Thank you again. He says, uh, Postmodern- postmodernism made it possible for a lot of young men to be Christian again. If you get to choose the, or if you get to choose the lens to view reality from, some will pick the beautiful one. That's an interesting take. What do you think about that? Oh, it's true. I, I think that even um, a good person to talk to this would be my friend Tyler Hamilton. Um, he he's very well learned in this. People know him as uh, his podcast because he he studied a lot of uh, in his his series on YouTube called Theopolitics, he studies um, people like John Milbank, who like basically wrote the book on postmodern theology. There's a lot of like heretical stuff, like me as a Catholic. Uh, but I get the sense, like if you were to like, um, if postmodernism could deliver young men into the realization, at least of some form of traditional Christianity, then I think it's a net positive. However, I would caution with theological issues to any particular faith that would be my caution i think that as a delivery mechanism it's good but when it comes to the full truth of for example catholicism or orthodoxy or whatnot then there's a lot of issues there Mm -hmm. um so but uh, yeah i I agree with the sentiment Mm -hmm. um yeah oh sorry uh people know tyler hamilton as theme star on youtube Uh, i highly recommend his theopolitics uh series um yeah Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that question. Let's see, we've got uh, a flamo, I guess is how to say it. Uh, Five dollars. <laughs> um, yeah. What do you think about the the works of Jack Chick? Uh, tell us. Chick tracks, how, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Chick tracks, absolutely. Um, Chick tracks, I think is um, prophetic, right? Like it's. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I love the one panel where it's like. Uh, the crowd, they're like, shut up. And he's like, they, uh, <laughs> they hated him because he spoke the truth. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. They hated yeah. him because he spoke the truth. Um, I think Jack Chick to give a serious answer would be that he, even though like he has a totally like bonkers evangelical view of Christianity, I think that as American Christian folk art, like there is no better than chick tracks. There mm. isn't. I think that if you look at like the artwork itself and like what he's actually trying to say, it's almost like it it, it comes off as almost like a Christian schizo poetics in the American evangelical context. I I do. I that in that sense, I admire like Jack chick and what he does. So yeah, yeah. no, I'm, I'm Southern Baptist. So I grew up with like chick tracks. Oh my God. Unironically, like, you know, grab a handful of these on your way out. Uh, (laughs) They would give it out in the youth service. Oh, absolutely. Um, Oh, amazing. Amazing. I'm very familiar uh, with that. (laughs) uh, We had, uh, we had like the youth missiles in a Sunday school, but like nothing, unfortunately, like there's, there really is no Catholic context for Jack Chick. I wish we mm-hmm. had our own yeah, version yeah, of Chick yeah, This is this is why you guys are culturally devoid. You know, if you only have the rich <laughs> uh, the rich art of Jack Chick, then yeah. perhaps the Catholic. But, the, but it's total yeah. folk art. Like even the way that he managed to like distribute his comics and his artwork through Baptist churches, like that is like the DIY of American Southern Gothic folk art. Like that's <laughs> yeah, I love it. Carbon Mike for $30. Very generous. Thank you, sir. Says, thanks for the excellent talk. Who is creating exit style networks uh, for aspiring creatives who want to make beautiful and good and true works? And what kind of infrastructure do they need? Well, I do know that uh, if you uh, speak, uh, if you go to my last talk, it was uh, with, uh, uh, with Bennett, Dr. Bennett there, Mm -hmm. and he is starting a exit organization. Uh, though I think his is more for general employment, but I'm yeah. sure that, you know, that it, there, all of this stuff is in its infancy. All of this is kind of being, you know, built from the ground up and no one has everything laid out yet. Um, right, but, right. but that could be something that they are, uh, would expand into eventually. I, th- I feel like that's kind of a niche thing for the moment. But of course, I, like I said, I do think that is essential work that has to get done. And I would love to see um, kind of a, a, 
you know, a, a place where an art community could uh, kind of work together and, and seek inspiration. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that, Gio? I think like if, if you look at the examples, ironically enough, from like the new left, you had like dissident art galleries, like dissident to the to the norm. Um, I remember someone during the chat with ZHP mentioned the symbolist painters symbolism. And then later art nouveau is a good model because art nouveau expressed a sense of rebelling against the tradition of academic painting to arrive at a more organic tradition that was present in like the European Faustian spirit, but they did it in like a, a way that was like an art collective that embodied a form of like the total work of art, like from painting like the image to the way that houses and buildings were designed to the way that um, various aesthetic expressions in like what they would consider pop culture is structured. I think that you would have to have an organic collective of artists that would be able to sustain themselves by creating a total work of a total aesthetic picture that isn't just limited to either fine art or illustration or whatnot or architecture. I think you would have to create almost like a right-wing version of Bauhaus, as crazy as that sounds. But when it comes to like what they need, obviously like the funding issue is there. Obviously the issue of patronage is like eternally the thing that plagues us. Um, there was a few examples. I mean, there was uh, my friend Daniel Miller, a amazing, fascinating art critic who organized the LD50 gallery. I mean, no, oh, this is ancient history. This is like 2016 mythos unfortunately it was shut down, but a lot of the early frog Twitter people, um, including some people that everyone hates now or one particular person, uh, uh, was involved in this gallery that was like denounced as like this terrible fascistic art gallery that had like protests. Now imagine if we were to have more dissident galleries. Imagine if we were to have like the DIY New York city punk, a uh, bunker art gallery like they used to have in the eighties, you know, like a um, fine arts America started off that way. I think it was called. Um, if you had like actual attempts to bring these things out more, I think that would be good for like even just the patronage issue. I mean, if you are an artist and this is something I have to do, actually, if you are an artist that does things that are um, a bit more appealing to the eye, then you will have like small, like local regional towns filled with boomers that probably would be willing to like buy your landscape paintings or like you could probably take over some of these like smaller regional galleries. Like for example, if like it's a bit more difficult with fine arts, but I mean, when it comes to other things, like, I mean, there's plenty of examples of music of uh, musicians with, you know, quote unquote problematic beliefs Um, there, but there are a few examples. I mean, for example, my friend Donald Kemp, uh, Donald Kemp on, on YouTube, uh, his channel is called American Zarathustra. He has this thing called the White Art Collective, which uh, they're, they're basically like a group of artists. I mean, of course, they're more like, um, you know, explicitly white nationalist, obviously. But I, I, I applaud what they're doing in terms of actually trying to make a difference and trying to like do things like revive folk art and like revive folk music that are integral to uh, their like, you know, pan European identity. Uh, there, there, so there are some like, models and examples. It's just that I think that it would like, I, the problem is every right winger, they want to like be in like a, a think tank, you know, like if we had the Hoover Institute, but more based then you know, all of uh, the bloggers could like go to this, uh, yeah. you know, that's the problem. I think that um, there has to be more attention paid to, a lot of these aesthetic spheres and aesthetic output, the way that we pay attention to podcasting and blogging. I know it's ironic because I myself is a podcaster like you, but I think that um, far too much attention is paid to creating the right wing Hoover Institute, you know? Yeah. So uh, yeah. No, I think that's true. And I, and I, I hope that is something that people break out of because, you know, mm. it, it, anyone um, as you said, you know, uh, I'm suggesting this, but I also have to use this form. So therefore I'm a hypocrite. I don't think that's true. Like I think, Oh no, of course. No, no. I, I, but, I, but I know I'm not saying this for you, but, but, you know, in general, like, I, I think we all are kind of trapped in what we have. You know, I think that yeah. localism is essential, but I'm talking to someone from Canada right now exactly, uh, about yeah. how to solve this problem. Right. So 
we're all we're all kind of you know stuck in you know the this kind of reality modern reality and we have to use the tools we have to reach where we want to go which means you know right. we may not immediately you know live or have exactly you know the thing that we that we're envisioning uh, but I don't think I think if we don't take these steps, then you just get nowhere. If you just are paralyzed because you're worried about being a hypocrite or, or not doing or suggesting something and, that is not exactly the way you yeah. live every moment right now, then you're just you're just paralyzing yourself. And in a sense, it's true. And in a sense, I think that um, for the foreseeable future, until they get rid of us all, uh, digital <laughs> nomadism is the way forward. Right. And yeah, absolutely. That's an escape. I mean, I have no illusions to. uh how bad, for instance, the art scene here here is in Canada. I mean, well, I'll say no more. I'll just get myself upset. So uh, yeah, yeah. let's <laughs> move on to our, our, our last question here. Uh, Z-Man uh, so, says, Bugman here, how do our art? I'm serious. Yeah, so for the heathens like me, if they're, you know, they, they want to take their first crack at uh, mm -hmm. trying to create, um, what, what would be your uh, advice? Um... God, this is, I'm going to upset some people by saying this. I think that if you want to create art, like not, I don't believe in like what people colloquially refer to as art for art's sake, but I think that the only way to truly be serious as an artist is if you have um, what Kandinsky called inner necessity to what you're doing. There has to be some kind of compulsion the way that a priest would approach the calling towards the faith. I think that if you wanted to do art just as a means of like whatever political propaganda, like I'm going to create this based in red pilled art movement. I think that you would be robbing yourself of a genuine exploration of your own artistic ability and your own artistic voice by just saying, the reason I'm doing this is entirely mercenary and for political reasons. That is unfortunately what I think the problem is um, left, right, and center. I mean, certainly on the left, you can, you know, this it's pretty easy, actually. You could just uh, have an identifiable, uh, you, know, you have an identity category and you can exploit that and you can, uh, you know, create uh, meddling uh, zombie formalist works of art that uh, don't really mean a hill of beans, but because you have the proper packaging of your own identity attached to it, then you can, you know, be entirely mercenary about it. But when it comes to us on the right, I think that we don't have that luxury. We don't have the sort of network that can be like, well, you know, maybe I don't care that much for pursuing the work of art as a, you know, for my whole life, but I can do it because I don't know, it can get me some spot on whatever conservative red pill, whatever network there is, we don't have that luxury. So therefore we have to rely on our own instincts. If you're truly serious about doing, pursuing the work of art, whatever that may be. Um, I think we can't afford to just uh, put out works that are transparently, you know, propaganda flyers. And this has always been my critique of how the modern dissident right has viewed the work of art. Uh, so yeah, that in a nutshell, be authentically an artist first and then think of the politics later. So, yeah. No, I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, well, guys, I need to go ahead and wrap this up, but this has been a great oh. talk. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I want to say thanks to all of the people who were uh, watching and commenting. We had some really great questions. If you are unfamiliar with Gio's work, I've went ahead and put his link tree uh, in mm. the description of the video and that's got everything it's got the break the rules podcast it's My got own his own youtube, YouTube channel. channel yeah yeah it's got Jenner it's productions got at youtube yeah yeah. Yep. yeah break the rules on youtube and Jenner productions uh Jenner productions i talk more about um i talk explicitly more about art criticism and currently i'm doing this thing where uh i do this re reading and commentary in the book of revelation but i will get back to doing more videos about art and culture and things like that so yeah. And of course, break the rules. We always have exciting guests. I think, uh, I think this week we have uncle Doomer. Um, we may have my friend Billy Pratt on and some guy, uh, I think we're talking to the guy who got kicked out of the school in New York for protesting critical race theory. I don't know. We'll, we'll see at the end of the month. I think we have Giorgiani on, so that's going to be interesting. 
um yeah yeah you guys always have uh really great uh, guests and mm. some really big names and so people should definitely uh check that out i think it's a excellent intersection of kind of these these spaces and, and kind of the more mainstream uh you always get some really interesting interactions uh so make sure you're you're following and and uh doing all that stuff uh with geo's work and of course i want to say thank you to geo it's been oh, a you. great one absolutely no i had a great time like i said it could have go a lot longer i wish yeah. i could but uh I but love maybe, hearing myself talk. So it's, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> well, we we wouldn't be doing this this if it wasn't the case. Um, so so uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll, but yeah, we'll definitely try to put another one of these to that together because this is a good time. Oh yeah, that'd uh, be amazing. But, but uh, thanks everybody for watching, and as always, I'll talk to you next time. God bless. And goodbye.